and use that methodology to develop product standards for olive oil. We developed the minimum price on our own, working with the farmers, press owners, and traders, local traders. And the minimum price at the time was 15 shekels, while the market price was 8. So for the farmers, this would be great. OK, they said 15 shekels would be great for us. And we started trading based on these uh, standards, not just, I mean, minimum price was one of the elements. Uh, but there are many other elements that has to go in the details of, of uh, uh, shared cropping and, and harvesting and the, the press wage and, and fair and all this. But the main thing is that we, uh, we, we had guidelines that guided our project. And we put those guidelines on the website and we told uh, the uh, potential fair trade buyers, this is how we are governed and you're welcome to come and see it to yourself how we apply these standards. And uh, some of these people actually did. And uh, even some communities did. The AFSC sent uh, a group, uh, one person, I have not a group, to check if we are actually uh, 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 implementing what we do, what we say we do, we, we implement, before they started by at the national level in Philadelphia. Uh, so that was very important that we put those standards uh, up on the website. And one of the other companies that was very like a, a, a life change in our, in our history, in our life, was Dr. Brunner. Dr. Brunner's in 2005, they decided they want to move their sourcing of raw materials into organic and fair trade sources. So they, they set up a, a, a fair trade and organic uh, palm oil production in, in Sri Lanka and uh, fair trade and organic uh, 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 sorry, it was coconut oil in Sri Lanka and palm oil in Ghana and mint oil in, in uh, India. And they found in Canaan the perfect partnership because we are set up for fair trade and, and, and organic. We are not certified yet organic. And we had a dialogue with Dr. Brunner for about uh, six months. And then they sent uh, three people to Palestine and to see the viability of the project, the viability of, of the project business-wise, fair trade-wise, and organic-wise. And sure enough, they were uh, very, very gracious in helping us in acquiring the certification. They helped us contract with a Swiss organization. At the time, we were trying to work with a German company to do the certification, the organic certification. But they helped us, and they hired the, the Swiss uh, organization, to the company, to come and offer training and then certification. And that Swiss company is called IMO, uh, had already in their uh, program, social accountability certification. And they were just advancing that social accountability certification into fair trade certification called Fair for Life. So we were one of the first few projects that they certified as Fair for Life in, in 2006. And we were able to certify organic as well, because we have in, uh, uh, a very well-developed approach to organic. So this is the story of, of uh, of fair trade certification in 2008, finally, we've, our product has become very successful in the UK market, and uh, uh, Equal Exchange was selling it. A group called Zaytun was selling it, and it's really turning up a lot of attention and and volume. So the Fair Trade Foundation here, all of this olive oil, fairly traded olive oil, is being sold in the market. They are missing out on that on that good publicity because there is a, a great deal of solidarity for Palestine in the UK, and the Fair Trade Foundation was missing out totally on it. So they are actually the ones who pushed flow. They said, we'll pay for the development of the standards, and they pushed flow, and in 2008, they came, and they did the homework of developing standards, and uh, they developed the minimum price for olive oil in, two, in, in, in September, and that was announced in September 2008, and in January 2009, we were the first project to certify FLO uh, uh, olive oil uh, worldwide. And from there, actually, uh, uh, Equal Exchange was able to uh, place uh, our, our product at Sainsbury and the cooperative after the, the flow certification. But for us, after the first organic certification, we were able to place the product at uh, COP Denmark, and uh, the, the product was there for as a trial in uh, in 15 stores, and this year is going into 750 stores. Oh, so, and under the Canaan brand, and we're very proud of that. 
in, in organic farming and certification, uh, we, uh, we, we built a lot of education first for the farmers that to emphasize the traditions of uh, sustainable production and building on those traditions. We are certified under what's called small holder scheme, which is uh, a way to set up an internal control system within the organization that trains the farmers and also inspect the farms and the farmers and their practices to make sure that they're uh, adhering to uh, uh, organic standards. And then we have the external certification body, which is IMO from Switzerland, which is accredited by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the EU Department of Agriculture, and Japan's department. And then they make sure that our ICS is functioning properly and able to detect non-confirmities if there are some non-confirmities and able to take the, correct, uh, the, the, the proper corrective measures and make those corrections. And based on, the, on that, the functionality of this system, then they, uh, they grant our certification. So the first certification uh, we had was in 2006, 375 farmers. In 2006, today we have over 1,000 farmers who are certified organic and with a total plots of about uh, 4,300 hectares. Together, uh, we represent as a single source the largest source of certified organic olive oil in the Middle East. And that's all by a, a local initiative that was done mainly grassroots. And obviously there are a lot of organizations who have worked on this and still working on this. They are not anywhere near what we've done. And I think part of in a great part is that our farmers are taking ownership in it and, and seeing the accountability, the credibility, and, and the meanings that are in this project and putting their energy into it. Uh, this, I mean, this is about as far as a certification, and we achieved certification, we are very proud of it, and we think it's very important, and really gave us a lot of entry to markets and put us part of this whole movement of fair trade and organic. But really for us, certification is only the beginning of the road. It's because certification, what it, it detects or vouches for, that we are not doing through anything wrong. We are not engaged in harmful practices. We're not engaged in exploiting our farmers or our workers. We're not engaged in uh, exploiting our environment in our own way. So all that certification is saying is that we're not bad. <laughs> it doesn't really tell us what great thing we're doing. And if we just, uh, I mean, satisfy ourselves that we're not bad, I don't think we're really so great. <laughs> Because none of us really would be happy with the minimum wage. None of us as companies really would be happy only with a minimum price to sustain our businesses. We all want to gain more profit to grow and extend our, uh, our, our reach and our impact. Well, uh, and that should be our attitude towards our farmers, our, our, uh, our workers, and our environment and its capacity to regenerate and produce the product that we produce. Yeah, because and eventually also this is an investment in ourselves. So we look at our investment in the project is a whole investment in the sustainability and the growth of the sustainability concept which allows for our growth together as a company and as producers and as a project and eventually as a society. And so today in the organic arena we have an organic research and training program uh, we recruited uh, a professor from Emeritus from North Carolina State University, John Sabella, who uh, started two uh, organic research centers in South America, in, uh, in Paraguay, uh, and uh, uh, what's the second one? Anyways, both of them are in South America. And I, I, I asked him to come and see what we, are, he, what we are doing in Palestine, and if he can help us. And, and, uh, he was reluctant at the beginning, and I told him, look, you just come, and you, you get a trip to Palestine, spend a month, two months, whatever you want, and it's paid for, it's free, and you meet the farmers, and see what you, if you can help them or not, or if you want to help them. And he did, and he came in March and spent part of April, and he was so thankful and excited that he did. And, uh, and he uh, went to the farms for three weeks, and then, I held a workshop for him with the farmers to develop research questions 
and he was so touched by the farmers and capacities and what he can do and how this has been meaningful to them and in and the way and how been important to them and before he left he told me it's not a matter of whether I want to do it right now I cannot not do it so I <laughs> said he went back to uh, South America to finish his commitment and he just did and he's coming back to Palestine this spring to spend a year or more with us and the idea is to uh, engage the farmers in research uh, uh, themselves they will be the researchers and the trainers themselves the, their farms will be the, the research fields and we're looking at how we can uh, 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 utilize the bulk of organic knowledge and what's applicable in our local environment to address the challenges that some of the challenges that we have and, what, and, and research our own traditions or farming traditions we have 2,000 years old trees uh, who are producing great olives. Much of the, the olive trees we, we cultivate are between 500 years to 2,000 years. So what's so great we've been doing all this time, and what are those traditions that have been so sustainable, so we can assert them for ourselves and increase our yield through them, and at the same time offer those practices and traditions to the, to the world community or to the, 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 the organic movement community. Uh, so uh, we are also, setting up the agenda, even the local agenda, they were integrating the local ministry extension agent in agents in the, in the training and the research so we can, whatever knowledge we, can, we cultivate, they can take it to the broader community before they are beyond our project. Our, the farmers are so excited about it and they are so engaged in it. Uh, so we're selecting a number of farmers for every village. The picture that you see here is the, is the difference between one of the, our farms in, uh, in uh, in a village called Al Araka near Jnim, that is intercropped with lentils as a legume that is feeding nutrients to the soil, and uh, the neighboring farmer who, who tills where the, the soil is dry and, uh, and, and not, and, and not uh, so rich as the one that you see in the right hand. Uh, so, this is something that we are guiding the farmers to do is to be soil focused, not fruit focused, not crop focused because the health of the soil is eventually what's going to produce sustainable fruit and healthy fruit for a long term. So we're, we're taking this knowledge and, and, and researching the knowledge of what they're doing and when we're seeing examples of, of great uh, practices, we are uh, 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 examining those practices and publicizing them and asking people to, to take uh, 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 parallels from those. Uh, we looked at, uh, we have one of the challenges, there are two challenges right now or three challenges that we, we face mainly in the olive farming is moisture retention and we're doing that with intercropping because we are in a dry area mainly uh, rain fed uh, and another challenge is an olive fly an olive fly uh, there is an olive fly that uh, lay eggs in the olive and the olive rot if the fly lays an egg on it there is there is a uh, a bowl that uh, the, the industry sells that uh, uh, make fermentation of the, the smell of the male fly so it attracts the, the olive fly and it's, they stick in the bowl but those are expensive especially the one with the fermentation so we, in our research we found that a, a lot of the old farms have uh, three or four carob trees uh, and those carob trees are actually bringing a lot of wasps and those wasps eat the fly so obviously those generations before us have developed a solution for the fly and it was right there before our eyes and we didn't know it. So we are now planting more carob trees in the new farm. Uh, 